Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Bitcoin series. I'm kicking it off, and then you're going to hear from some, from some other great speakers right after me. I'm really excited to talk to you about Bitcoin today. Bitcoin is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and I've been in this space for almost 10 years. So my section is going to cover the basics. We're going to cover the basic principles of how Bitcoin works, and then later on, you're going to hear some more, more of the advanced techniques or the more advanced understanding of, of how Bitcoin functions. And so Bitcoin is a trillion, almost a trillion dollar asset. You can't ignore it any longer. You might have heard about it before. Your friend, your family member, they might have told you about it and you go, you know what? I'll learn about that later. You can't ignore it any longer. It's almost worth a trillion dollars. Bitcoin is here to stay. Now, what is Bitcoin? One of my favorite comedians, John Oliver, says that Bitcoin is everything you don't understand about money with everything you don't understand about computers. Or at least that's how it feels, right? It feels really confusing and it feels really, you know, it, all this maths, it feels very, very confusing. Well, you're not, you know, you're not alone in that feeling. A lot of people in the audience feel that way. And the reason why is Bitcoin has a complex intersection of various different topics. Economics, computer science, cryptography, all these things layer into why Bitcoin is complex but we're gonna to try to make it a little bit more simple for you today so you can get the basics. So starting with the most fundamental part of Bitcoin, Bitcoin is decentralized. And what does that mean? So in the traditional financial world, your bank account is controlled by a bank. With Bitcoin, that's not the case. No one controls your Bitcoin wallet and no one controls your, the Bitcoin network. It's decentralized in the terms of control. No one can singularly control Bitcoin. Now, you've probably heard the term called the blockchain. The blockchain is simply a series of sequential blocks, and these blocks contain transactions that have occurred in a relative time period of 10 minutes and the newly minted Bitcoin. And so these blocks are confirmed by Bitcoin miners or minted or, or essentially put into the Bitcoin blockchain by miners. And those miners use energy. So they use energy and use that uh, as a way to anchor or burn in those, trans those blocks onto the Bitcoin blockchain. That way we can trust what transactions happened before other transactions. Without Bitcoin's costliness or its proof of work function, its Bitcoin mining function, we wouldn't know who owns what. But the miners put all of the transactions in a sequential fashion so we understand who owns what Bitcoin. Now, one of the greatest aspects of Bitcoin is the monetary policy. So with Bitcoin, the monetary policy is 21 million Bitcoin, and that is the maximum amount that will ever be produced. Now, why 21 million and why a fixed amount? Well, the number doesn't necessarily matter. All that matters is that it's fixed. When it's fixed, that actually solves a couple different problems. There's a classic problem in traditional finance about choosing the appropriate rate of inflation. Is it 1%, 2%, 3%? As we've seen from my home country, the United States, we constantly are changing our rate of inflation and we don't know which one is the appropriate level. What that does is it introduces a political attack vector into a monetary policy because presidents, congresspeople will lobby to have their inflation rate or their policies impact that inflation rate. And so by setting the inflation rate at zero, that eliminates any bureaucracy or politicians that could weigh in on Bitcoin or any sort of political leanings that could influence the Bitcoin protocol. It also solves the problem of bootstrapping the network. Because 21 million exist, there is no supply response. As Bitcoin becomes more popular and the price goes up, there's no newly minted Bitcoin to go fit that demand. So we see the price of Bitcoin go very high and that is in a viral loop in which more people become aware of Bitcoin and, and buy into the Bitcoin network. So it acts as a bootstrapping mechanism. We're still pretty early in Bitcoin's life cycle. So if we compare it to the early stages of the internet, we're very much on the same trajectory. We're slowly going from zero awareness to becoming a ubiquitous or a universal sort of thing that people use, and that takes time. If we look at other types of technology like the refrigerator, electric power, the internet, they all have adoption curves that look similar to Bitcoin's. Bitcoin is just getting started in its journey to becoming a global money, becoming a money that replaces fiat money or the government money that you currently use. And I want to give a little bit of a story here 
on how Bitcoin got started. Because before we go into the technical aspects of Bitcoin, I want us to truly understand why it's important. And so I wrote a series a couple years ago called Planting Bitcoin, Bitcoin's origin story. And so Satoshi's brilliance wasn't just in the species of new money he decided to create, but it was the season, the soil, and the gardening techniques that made Bitcoin successful. Bitcoin, like any other organism, and as a new species of money, had specific types of DNA. And that DNA in, in Bitcoin's world is the code. And that code incentivizes the organization of cellular function, just like an organism would. And if you look here, we've got Bitcoin versus like the dollar and the pound. Bitcoin has superior traits though. So Bitcoin's genetic code in terms of how it was constructed lent, or uh, basically evolve up to the traits that it, or shows the traits that it has as money. So traits, for example, in an animal might be its eye color or, or fur or something like that. With money, we have these traits that money has. And so some of these, I don't wanna go through all of them, but you might notice ones like verifiable. Well, how do you know the pesos in your hand or the dollars in your hand are real? Well, they've got little strips on there to help validate that it's real because it's hard to, you know, hard to counterfeit that. Or with gold, we have very complex machines that can go analyze gold. Um, but with Bitcoin, you can perfectly validate your Bitcoin with your cell phone. And there's no way to make a fake Bitcoin, which is really, really amazing. Other things that are important as well are the portability. You can't email me a brick of gold. But with Bitcoin, I can send you Bitcoin instantly anywhere in the world. Technically, I could send it even in space because Bitcoin moves at the speed of light. And so there's other factors as well, but as you can see, Bitcoin has much more advantageous traits as a money than all previous monies before it. Over time, there have been various world reserve currencies. In my country, the United States, we have, had, we have been the global reserve currency for over about 100 years now. Bitcoin represents a new species of money that I believe will be the dominant species of money on this planet. And this might be the Bitcoin era, where previous government monies, as we talk about it from a life like an organism, go extinct and Bitcoin eventually replaces them. So now that we've covered Bitcoin's species or why Bitcoin is a superior species of money, we're gonna talk about the season in which Bitcoin was planted. So Satoshi, and I love this quote from Satoshi, this is the core problem that Bitcoin is solving. It's solving the problem of trust. In the traditional financial world, you have to trust your bank. You have to trust your government. With Bitcoin, you don't have to do that. You don't have to trust your politician's bank or government. You can trust the Bitcoin protocol. And when we look at the cause of financial crises, We've got Henry Paulson, who is the former U.S. Treasury Secretary, stating that I believe the root cause, the core root cause of these crises are government policies. These financial crises are developed from government policy. And as Alan Greenspan, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, said, we need a store of value, a safe store of value asset like gold. And Bitcoin solves that. And when we look at the, uh, when the Fed was created and we look at global median and inflation rates for 800 years, this was compiled by Deutsche Bank in the Journey into the Unknown Long-Term Asset Management Study. When we look at inflation over 800 years, when the Fed was created, we've had unprecedented inflation. And this yields all sorts of socioeconomic problems, which Saif Adin and Alex Gladstein will cover later in their presentations. When we look at fiat money, it's created to basically lose value over time. Because of inflation, the value or your purchasing power of what your dollars or euros or pesos can buy slowly erode. And with Bitcoin, like gold, it's a safe store of value asset where it can't be inflated away. Satoshi planted Bitcoin in the middle of the 2008 financial crisis. In fact, it was October 31st, 2008, in which he published it to the cryptographer mailing list. At that moment, and this was published within a week of that, Mohammed El Arain is a very well-known individual in the traditional finance space. This was his feeling in that moment in which Satoshi planted Bitcoin. He felt that the world was going to end. And so when we think about why did we build Bitcoin or why did Satoshi build Bitcoin, he built it to make sure that we didn't have the problem of trust again with our institutions because we had lost faith in our institutions. Bitcoin was launched in a time when we, the, the whole system collapsed and we needed something new. 
So now that we've covered Bitcoin's genetic code and why it's a su superior species of money, and we've covered the moment in which it was planted, I want to talk about the soil or who he first shared this with. I like this image because it's, a, it's an image of a boy in a bookstore in London during the World War II. And it's a very striking image because you've got this bombed out bookstore, but this boy is engrossed with reading this book. And I would imagine that the cypherpunks, when seeing Bitcoin for the first time, probably felt the same way. The world around them had been torn to pieces in the 2008 financial crisis, and Bitcoin was this portal to a new world. And this was his white paper. He published this to the cryptographer mailing list, and so Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer cash electron electronic cash system. The cryptographer mailing list was comprised of these individuals and many more. The cryptographers were individuals who had fought against encryption uh, restrictions in the 1990s. For example, in the, in the 1990s, the US government called encryption a weapon. And so these cryptographers printed out encryption on their t-shirts to wear their weapon around and they won a First Amendment or free speech uh, battle in US courts. So these individuals like Adam Beck, he created the precursor to proof of work. We have Hal Finney, uh, he created uh, reusable proof of works. Uh, Wei Dai, B Money, Nick Zabo, BitGold. Satoshi built Bitcoin on top of these foundations, on top of all of these great individuals' thoughts around cryptography and socioeconomics. Satoshi, in fact, thought he was late. A lot of people automatically dismiss e-currency as a lost cause because of all the companies that failed since the 1990s. I hope it's obvious that it was only the centrally controlled nature of these systems that doomed them. This is the first time we're trying a decentralized, non-trust-based system. And when we look at Bitcoin's history, and let's see, this is a video, we'll see if this works. Oh, maybe not. Okay, well, it's supposed to, it's supposed to play a video, but this is Bitcoin's it's essentially genetic history. All the different types of monies or technologies that were developed that Bitcoin is built on top of. Bitcoin isn't MySpace. It's a very long iteration of 40 years of experimentation. Now, when Satoshi created Bitcoin, he created this white paper, but he had much more content that he created. So when you go explore Bitcoin, don't just read the white paper, go read all of his posts on the Bitcoin Talk forums. Um, and so Pierre Rochard, a colleague of mine, said this, if, Bitcoin, if, if the Bitcoin white paper is the Declaration of Independence, the source code is the Constitution. The cypherpunks, the group of individuals that Satoshi interacted with, they very much cared about producing code. It's not enough to talk about it. We gotta go make it work. We gotta go make it happen. And Satoshi, four months after he published the Bitcoin white paper, produced the source code, or the code that you could run to, to work on the Bitcoin network. Now that we've covered, uh, uh, now that we covered species, season, soil, we're gonna cover gardening. So how did Bitcoin develop and how did it fr uh, thrive and survive? So this is a, uh, a GIF from Mr. Robot, a TV show where um, this hacker here, he essentially disrupts the global financial system. And so Satoshi was very much a rebel. And Satoshi was this enigmatic figure where Satoshi, we don't actually know who he or she is. Satoshi is a pseudonym. We don't know if this person is from South America, the United States, Europe, or Asia. And the, he did this very intentionally. I'm gonna use he just to make it simple. He used this very intentionally because if anyone could be leveraged to change the Bitcoin protocol, it would be him. If there's a leader, that's a weak point, And that would for perpetually be a political attack vector for the protocol. So Satoshi decided to remove himself from the equation as that risk point, as that weak point in the network. Bitcoin, and I think what's so interesting about it is that it's not necessarily a technological breakthrough it's a social one. It's, it's, it's about us all believing in Bitcoin, and through that Bitcoin accrues more value and becomes more real and has more protected and more technologies are built on top of it. And I love this quote from Mark Twain. In the beginning of a change, the patriot is a scarce man and brave and scorned. When his cause succeeds, the timid join him, for then it costs nothing to be a patriot. Satoshi, in the early days of Bitcoin, had a higher issuance of Bitcoins in the beginning and lesser issuance of Bitcoins today and in the future. That incentivized early hodlers. Hodlers are those who choose to hold Bitcoin despite the massive volatility. And so I believe that Satoshi wanted to find a group of rebels to help him start this and the cypherpunks and the early participants in the community were people who wanted a change in their life. They wanted to 
They had already seen what happened with the financial system. They were ready to believe in something new. And so hodling is this hero's journey. You go through an awakening. You go through a process of questioning the nature of your, your reality, like waking up from the matrix. And then you go through the process of buying Bitcoin and then going through the volatility and then understanding how it works. And so I, I love the idea that it's this, this hero's journey. Um, what's interesting too is, like I mentioned before, Satoshi built in this viral loop, this viral loop to attract more users and that's the fixed quantity. Because there's no supply responses, demand increases, more and more people pile in because the price goes higher, which increases the awareness of Bitcoin. And then as more people buy in, it makes the price go higher and more awareness and adoption. And if we look at, so the blue line is Bitcoin's uh, issuance schedule and the white chart is Bitcoin's price. And the, those moments when it drops on the dotted lines, those are called halvings. That's when the Bitcoin issuance drops in half. And so Bitcoin's issuance is an asymptotic curve approaching zero over time. And so that's, uh, it, as we see that fixed quantity and these supply shocks lead to more adoption because the price climbs, people become more aware of it, and that reflexivity kicks in. Ultimately, Bitcoin is about a new financial system, and that's a little bit of a rebellious act. We have to reject the, the existing system. We have to reject the existing status quo. And so those who opt into Bitcoin are trading something abundant for something scarce, trading the past for the future, and trading financial dependence for financial sovereignty. And this quote from Nikola Tesla, really love this too. Let the future tell the truth and evaluate each one according to his work and accomplishment. The present is theirs. The future for which I have really worked is mine. To believe in something new, you have to take risk. And it feels scary, but it's something that you need to go through to evolve and adapt. And that's the only constant in life is change. So I've got a couple minutes here. I'm gonna cover common misconceptions. This is gonna be a little bit of fun. So, Bitcoin has no intrinsic value. You've probably heard this one before. Well, the St. Louis Federal Reserve, which is a US institution, said that Bitcoin has no intrinsic value, but state currencies like the US dollar have no intrinsic value either. How to value Bitcoin? People are like, it's too expensive. You know, Bitcoin today is worth, uh, I think it's in the 40,000 ranges. So Bitcoin is that tiny, tiny little blip in the bottom right-hand corner there. Bitcoin isn't even worth as much as Apple. Apple is one US tech stock. Bitcoin is tremendously undervalued when compared to other things that are more, I would more, say would more, be more applicable like gold, $10 trillion market cap, or global money, a $31 trillion market cap. Bitcoin has barely touched on a trillion dollar market cap and it's got a long ways to go. Bitcoin's a bubble. Well, if Bitcoin was a bubble, it'd be the longest bubble ever in human history. It's not a bubble. <laughs> If we look at other bubbles that are commonly referred to, like the NASDAQ, the dot-com bubble, South Seas bubble, Tulip bubble, those all lasted far less than Bitcoin. Bitcoin's not a bubble. And when we look at, yeah, and this doesn't look like a bubble to me. If you look at it in a log form, Bitcoin isn't going to zero every couple of years. It's going up and to the right over time. Blockchain, not Bitcoin. Well, if you don't have a block reward for your blockchain, you can't secure it. There's no incentive for miners to organize transactions in the proper manner. And so this term is somewhat meaningless. To have a blockchain means you need a native crypto asset like Bitcoin in order to secure it. Bitcoin is hackable. It's kind of like saying that gold has been hacked when a vault was cracked because someone left their keys to the vault on the counter. Bitcoin is not crackable. It would take 10,000 years with every computer on earth to crack one Bitcoin wallet. That's how secure this technology is. Bitcoin would be useful if it was used for payments. This is a very common question that I get or a very common statement that I hear. <clears throat> so you mean gold isn't useful because I'm not spending gold anywhere. I mean, <laughs> no one spends gold anymore, but gold is worth $10 trillion. Bitcoin needs regulations. Well, in the US alone, it's already highly regulated by the SEC, CFTC, FinCEN, IRS, and those are just the names I can remember off the top of my head. Governments could kill Bitcoin. Well, just like how the United States won the war in Vietnam and Afghanistan, I don't think so. Or the war on drugs, which they haven't won. Or all the governments coming together to solve climate change, which they haven't. Or, you know, ultimately it's based on game theory. All governments aren't gonna agree with each other to stop Bitcoin. There's gonna be some that are gonna be Confederates. They're not gonna want to um, side with all the other governments because 
the enemy of the enemy is your friend. China and Russia and the US are never gonna get along. Central bank digital currencies are the same as Bitcoin. They're not. Central bank digital currencies are very different from Bitcoin, so when you hear about people talking about it as an innovation, it is not. Central bank digital currencies are essentially like the book 1984, where the government can censor and monitor all transactions and seize transactions based on your political affiliation or a bad word you said on Twitter that day. And so with Bitcoin, Bitcoin is totally different because you have absolutely, and I, th I think this slide got a little bit funky, um, you have total control over your money, you have some privacy, and it's a monetary policy breakthrough. So this is my last slide. Not taking risk is the riskiest option. You've heard about Bitcoin, you're gonna hear about it from a couple other speakers. Give it some thought, give it some consideration because you've probably heard about it before and not taking that risk or not even learning about it is the most risky thing you can do. Thank you for having me, appreciate it.